So welcome to our webinar about International Day of Women and Girls in STEM. My name is Charlotte Weekout. I'm on the People and Culture team here at Altus. And something that we're really passionate about is empowering women to achieve in their careers. So we're so excited to have you all join us here today for our panel. For those of you who don't know, the International Day of Women and Girls in STEM was born out of the Sustainable Development Goals number nine, which is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. So today we're really celebrating women who are leading innovation and calling for actions to remove all the barriers that hold them back. Um, so you too can join the conversation at Women, women in Science. So I'm just having some difficulty with my slideshow, sorry. Just share it again. Fantastic. So here is the hashtag, join the conversation women in science. So on the panel today, we have Hannah Beda, who is the technical lead at Creatable and the 2020 New South Wales Young Woman of the Year. We have Gemma Lloyd, who is a CEO and entrepreneur of Work 180. We also have Dr. Eva Cheng, who is the Director of Women and Engineering in IT at the University of Technology, Sydney. We've got Veronica Coyle, who is the Principal Consultant and Data for Good Lead at Data for Good and Paige Nguyen, who is a recent developer graduate and consultant here at Altus. There's going to be opportunity for Q&A at the end of this session. There's just a little box down the bottom um, with a couple of speech bubbles. So I invite you to pop your questions in there. And without further ado, let's get going. So my panel will be joining me on the screen in just a moment. Here we go. Hi everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm going to get stuck straight in with some questions. I'm going to throw it out to Eva first. Um, do you want to tell us about your self-confidence journey from studying STEM to pursuing it as a career? Yeah, thanks Charlotte. This is a great question to kick off with because actually I think my journey was partially in hindsight. I didn't realise when I was studying engineering that I was kind of uh, having a lot of self-doubt, having not a lot of confidence. I mean, I won a scholarship to study engineering and then I won a scholarship to study my PhD, but I always kind of felt like I didn't deserve it, which sounds crazy. So in hindsight, I think back and go, I spent a lot of time over preparing, doing more than necessary and trying to prove myself and apologizing, you know, starting emails and conversations with sorry but that is not necessarily a positive start to any kind of conversation and building up your presence and your profile. So what I've been working on over the last, uh, let's say five, 10 years of my career, because I realized this actually probably well into my academic career is that none of this is necessary. You know, catch yourself when you're having some of those self-doubt um, internal conversations and call it out, you know, talk about and think about what your strengths and weaknesses are and, you know, bring those strengths to the table. The other thing I've been working on is owning and celebrating my achievements. You know, for a long time, I, I kept hiding the fact that I had a PhD and was a doctor because I didn't feel like I kind of deserved it or, you know, I was just another one of the PhD graduates, but that's not the case, you know, I own it and it's everywhere that I put my name. So it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> Fantastic. Gemma, do you want to tell us about your journey? Yeah, mine was slightly different to um, Eve because I actually was very confident when I kind of entered the workforce. And um, it was whilst I was in the workforce working in the tech sector and many of my, well, 99% of my colleagues were male, which is when my, my confidence completely shut down. So my peers would ask me to go and get them coffee fees, take their notes, essentially treating me like I was one of their assistants. And um, because I was so early on in my journey, I just thought, well, this is what work is like. And you just go and you do the job and be quiet and kind of do as you're told. Um, but um, it never really sat well with me. And so it was just, there was one defining moment where I was in a meeting and there was 12 of my male colleagues and myself and the manager did what he always did and said, Gemma, take the notes to the meeting. And I actually put my hand up and said, I've actually got a lot I'd like to contribute today. Would you mind if somebody else did it? And straight away, another guy was like, yeah, sure, no worries. 
I'll do it. And that was my first kind of experience of unconscious bias. And uh, it wasn't purposeful or malicious on their part, not making excuses, it's wrong. And But I did realise that they didn't know what they were doing. And so I had to kind of take control at that time to, to start pushing back. And then going into my next role, my boss was a woman and my boss's boss was a woman. And it was a software engineering firm where it was just truly inclusive. And the um, experience I had there was, was wildly different. And I think, you know, from that point on, my confidence has, has been, you know, has been good, but still even to this day, doing what I'm doing as an entrepreneur, I am, um, it's interesting still some of the kind of comments that you get um, meeting kind of other male entrepreneurs or even investors and that type of thing, which um, could, could uh, give your confidence a bit of a hit. Definitely. Um, Hannah, do you want to give us a bit of insight into your self-confidence journey? Sure. Um, I'll go back maybe a little further um, than Gemma and Eva back to high school um, where I was at a co-ed high school. So I was very used to learning around boys and girls, which meant that when I landed up at university um, and I'd enrolled in my, <clears throat> pardon me, my first degree was actually in electrical engineering and science. So I didn't know quite where I wanted to head and it took me a year or so to figure out that that was computer science. Um, it meant that while I wasn't shocked um, by the ratios of boys, I wasn't shocked by the, the fact that there were so many boys, but I was shocked by just like how many there were um, and how few women there were. And I remember seeing like one or two girls across the lecture theatre and locking eyes and being like, we're going to be friends forever because you can't leave me and this is just it for us now. Um, so finding, finding peers that I connected with was what really brought my confidence um, up and when I did tra transfer within my degree you know all your friends start specializing too and I walk into the room I'm like where'd everyone go um, was the same sort of time I started teaching at university mm -hmm. and there's something about teaching something to someone else that just cuts right through the imposter syndrome because you can't pretend you don't know what you're saying because you've literally transferred it from your brain into someone else's brain. So as much as I'd like to be, um, as much as I was thinking, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing, I, I've, I've given somebody else knowledge, which is a, which was a really, really big um, boost to my own confidence and built up those skills that you wouldn't necessarily associate with a tech degree, which is communication, ed education, um, collaboration, confidence when presenting, um, public speaking, all those kinds of things. So it took many years, but um, yeah, that was, that was the confidence journey for me was like really coming into my own was helping others learn things too. Um, and it always helped consolidate my own learning as well. Fantastic. I'm gonna throw it over to you, Veronica. So when you first started your STEM career, did you have a lack of female role models? And if you did, how did that impact your confidence? Yeah, um, to be honest, no. Um, so it's true that there weren't as many women in senior roles, but they were certainly there. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't feel that I was impacted or, or that I couldn't carve out a career there. I definitely felt, you know, there were women there that I could talk to, that I could see were successful. Um, as I said, you know, there weren't as many. Um, but that didn't matter to me. It, it honestly never occurred to me that that was going to stop me in any way. Um, so no, um, I was always confident that, that I could uh, get a leadership position as a woman and there were women that I could emulate. Awesome. Did anyone else have an experience with lack of or, or lots of female role models um, coming up in, in their careers? Yeah, I think going back to where you know, what I said before, it actually wasn't until I did have a, a woman as a boss and her boss was a woman where I saw myself really being able to progress. And um, Veronica, it's it's great that you kind of, you know, had that self-confidence and, you know, it didn't, but I think, you know, I was in the unfortunate place where because of the way I was treated, those role models were extremely important for me. And following on from that, then I joined groups such as Females in Technology and Telecommunications and Women in Technology and just surrounding myself by other amazing women in the industry um, really made me see that, yes, I can, I can do this and there are others who have come before me. Fantastic. So Hannah, how do you motivate yourself and stay motivated in your role? 
So I know that you've got a really good role with Creatable. So tell us a bit about that and yeah, how you stay motivated. Sure. So um, before I joined Creatable, I was working as a software engineer. Um, and I'd been in that industry for a couple of years working at Macquarie Bank. And I had a couple of internships with Google. I'd worked with a startup. Um, but what I realized when I was there was that something I think I'd always known, um, which is that I like coding, but not as much as everyone else. And the enjoyment that I get from it is not the doing, it's the, the what you produce. You know, it's not, for me, it wasn't the journey, it was the destination. So um, what I realized was that that was the case, but the other side of that coin is that my passion was for um, teaching and education within computer science. So even while I was working as a software engineer, I had roles on the side um, teaching high school girls, women, um, every single every single person under the sun, uni students, like at all ages, how to code. Um, and nobody else was doing that. So I realized, oh, okay, so there is something that I like, that I'm good at, that I would do, you know, I'd do it through the night for free um, where I wouldn't do that in my current job and somebody else would, and that's fine. Um, but coming to terms with that reality is what gave me the confidence to pivot into tech education full-time instead of just as all my little side hustles while I was working as a software engineer. And I think any anybody who is a woman in a technical field will find themselves um, attracting attention when you do things that promote other women, because people do care about it in general. So even when I was in my software engineering role, I had people flocking um, interested in what I was doing elsewhere and outside. So I thought, okay, maybe there's a reason I should do this. And moving into the role at Creatable, um, I feel very lucky to say, I don't actually need to find motivation because I've really locked myself into a job that is motivating to me in general. Um, I had to find motivation in my previous job because it wasn't inherently motivating to me. So now I feel that in making a difference to people's lives, in educating people and giving them the tools and confidence they need to build products and bring their ideas to life, that is, that's motivating to me and that's what I'm doing. So if I'm acting out and acting on my passions, um, the motivation doesn't need to be um, dug up from somewhere inside me to get me through a challenging day. Yeah, I think the big, if the big picture is aligned, um, it almost to me doesn't matter what the actual execution is if I know that I'm doing generally what I want to be doing. Fantastic. What about you, Eva? How do you stay motivated? Yeah, totally on board with what Tana's saying around values alignment. You know, if you believe in what you do, uh, it's coming inside out. Having said that, though, um, something I need to be mindful of is because I love what I do, I do need to not do it 24-7. Uh, otherwise, you know, some things become a little too frustrating. You take it home and, you know, it's a little bit much. But I do love the fact that, you know, the Women in Engineering and IT program is my job. So how do I stay balanced um, and motivated for other things that I enjoy in, in academic life is to make sure that I have time to do the things that brought me into STEM in the first place. So for me, that's the combination of music and computing and algorithms and programming. So I do make sure that there's always some project that I'm tinkering away at, especially with collaborators, because we always come up with more fun things in a diverse team. And there's always space for that. Awesome. So pivoting off that, Gemma, what advice would you have for the next generation of females who are up and coming in STEM? Um, great question. So I think um, the, f the first thing is that you don't need to put up with environments or workplaces that aren't inclusive and won't support you. And um, so obviously I'm the CEO of Work 180 and our endorsed employers of which Altus is one of those are places that are genuinely committed to supporting women in the workplace. So just don't do what I did and stay somewhere too long where I was poorly treated. <laughs> Great, what about you Veronica? Yeah, I think um, what I would add to that is you know, there certainly may be hurdles along the way. I think there are in every career and in every life. Um, but I think the advice I would give to the next generation is, you know, be aware that you might encounter hurdles, but your focus should be on the opportunities and 
you know, which ones of those do you want to take advantage of? How do you get there? And, you know, keep your eye on, on that. There are so many opportunities in STEM at the moment, and there's so much happening. And I think um, if we go out and seek opportunities and stay focused on that, we're more likely to be happy. If you focus on the hurdles, they become the only thing you see. Um, whereas really, they're just, you know, they might be a little bump in the road. Yes, you might have to do a detour, but stay focused on your opportunities. Fantastic. I'm going to pick on Paige next. Paige, you're a recent graduate of the developer program and you're a new consultant here to Altus. And so on your journey um, to where you are now, what's a core message that you've received from your mentors along the way? Um, so back to what you said, Gemma, earlier, yes, know your community, but most importantly, know your network and, you know, being a part of Altus, you guys have been so supportive and my developer program has been very rewarding. Not only did I gain so many certifications from it, but Dan, my mentor, was very, um, he, yeah, he gave me great um, guidance along the way and one of his main um, advice was to honestly be curious. And, you know, there's only so much that, so much that you know, but really um, always be curious and just know that you need to have that willingness to learn. And yes, don't be intimidated by other people. They might look like they know everything, but really there's just an infinite amount of things out there, especially with IT as well. So yeah, definitely be curious and have that drive and willingness to learn, yeah. Awesome. Does anyone else have anything that they really jumps out to them from their mentors along the way? Um, I can jump in. I think, um, you know, one thing that I heard along the way, and I wouldn't have thought it was something that I struggled with, um, but there were a few mentors who encouraged me to speak up at times when, you know, I might be sitting in a, a meeting, we might be discussing something that I think, well, I'm not the expert on that. Um, so I don't need to contribute. But I had one mentor in particular who always made a point of turning to me and asking for my opinion. Um, and I often found that, well, in fact, you know, I, I did have more to contribute than many of the other people in the room. So don't be shy, even if you're thinking, well, this isn't really my area. Um, definitely, you know, have that confidence to jump in, even as asking questions, asking clarifications, um, you know, make your presence known and don't be afraid to speak up. Um, and I think there's a couple of ways that that applies as well. Um, you know, if someone's asking you to get the coffee, by all means, you know, you, you can speak up and say, sure, you know, I'll do it this week, your turn next week. <laughs> and, um, you know, just having that confidence to be able to, um, to talk, to say something, I think is really important. Yeah, agreed. What about you, Eva? Yeah, I think a good piece of advice I've received is, because I'm a bit ad hoc, you know, I go with the flow. Uh, so I do need to do a little bit of planning, but not too much planning so that you're open to opportunities. Um, so that's where agility comes in. And that particularly came into play when I was traveling to the US with, with a group. And one of my mentors said, look, plan enough so that you've got some meetings in place for San Francisco, but don't plan your whole day because you're just gonna meet all these fabulous people and you need to have space for that. So I've kind of extended that to life in general is to be prepared for change and embrace it. Yeah, definitely. I love, I love those messages that are coming through. Um, I'm gonna pick on you, Gemma. So what tools, I'm just going to do a bit of a 360 here, have, what tools have you found that have really been helpful throughout your career? That's a, that's a really interesting question and because I think, yeah, I was trying hard about the, the tools that I've, that I've kind of used to help me, but there was only kind of one that really um stuck out and um this was it's a it's a pom it's called the pomodoro technique i don't know if you've ever heard of it but essentially um the way it's used is that you have 25 minutes of strict kind of focus time and then you have a break to do whatever and you can open any other browsers or anything like that but because my day is completely full of interruptions all the time and um, phone calls and people and I don't I I was very reactive and didn't get a lot of that kind of really deep work thinking time but since using this you've got 25 minutes you block everything else out really allowed me to kind of focus and be very proactive and actually get stuff stuff done awesome 
Anybody else have a great tool, something to share that's really been helpful? Hannah, Paige? Sure. Um, I read a lot um, outside of the realm of tech as well. Um, it's like a hobby that I, I found myself a few years ago um, noticing that I was always talking about books and then I'm thinking, but I read them so long ago, like years and years, you know, and they've clearly had an impact on me. Why am I not reading more? Um, so I picked up this hobby again and I've found that the more I, I read a lot of uh, nonfiction and a lot of fiction, probably half, half. Um, but it, what it does is it really makes the connections between everything in the world very clear. Yeah. Um, and I've found that it's given me an incredibly well-rounded perspective, um, not just on like what I do day to day, like what a job is and like what the tech industry is. It's like how humans in the world exist, the systems that underpin um, our society, the history that got us to where we are, um, all that kind of stuff. So it's, I, I think reading as a tool is a really great way to get perspective on um, on life in a way that I find quite calming because sometimes when we encounter problems, we think this is so challenging and so specific and, you know, it's never happened before. It's first have it ever happening to anyone. It's happening to me, but actually there's so many lessons we can learn um, just from expanding our, our world a little bit. And I find, especially in COVID, that one of the best ways to do that is, is by reading. Fantastic. So I know that we've touched on confidence being a big Thing, uh, for women in STEM. I want to know, and I want you to talk yourselves up here, what is your biggest accomplishment to date? So if I throw that back to you, Hannah, to start us off and we'll go around the group. Um. Sure. Um, every time I teach a new class and I introduce myself and my boss, um, I never say it. And then he always says it. And then I'm like, oh my God, okay, one day I'm just going to say it. So um, Around this time last year, I was awarded New South Wales Young Woman of the Year, which was the absolute highlight of my life to date. I know that's a very cheesy thing to say, um, but I have spent a really, really, really long time um, investing in women's education and computing. And to have that be uh, cared about and validated by my community, as well as like the state of New South Wales mm -hmm. is incredibly humbling. Um, I met some people there who are now in close friends of mine. Um, one of the other finalists, I work with her um, at her company now, on a contract, you know, teaching um, financial literacy to women. Um, and the other finalist is like a close friend of mine. So, you know, the, the connections that it brought to me was amazing, but it's also like my biggest achievement to date. And people would see my mom on the street and be like, oh my gosh, congrats. And I had no idea how they had heard about it. So um, it's the first time in my life where I feel like something something bigger has really happened um, to me. That's fantastic. Uh, what about you, Gemma? Yeah, um, I really like this question just because I, um, going back to the confidence thing, sometimes go, you're not doing enough. You're you know why aren't you here and I actually sometimes write a list of things that I've done which are big achievements because it then makes me feel like you're being way too hard on yourself um so I um so obviously starting work 180 um to date we've raised 5.8 million dollars in capital from investors we've launched into not just Australia but the UK and the US as well and um, this social impact that we've driven. So in the last year, 38 companies have improved at least one benefit. So actually in total, 111 benefits were improved last year from Work 180 endorsed employers, which then went on to impact 280,000 people. And so that's something that um, I'm really proud of. And then just um, also the other thing um, that is a bit of a pinch me moment was I was invited to 10 Downing Street by Prime Minister Theresa May to talk about the UK tech sector. And um, yeah, that was that was really special and kind of walking down the stairs in 10 Downing Street. I don't know if anyone's seen Love Actually where Hugh Grant kind of dances down the... I was picturing that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, that is awesome. What about you, Paige? 
I would say that it's not as grand as Hannah's or Gemma's. Um, I mean, I just started my career in IT. I recently graduated, but I feel like my whole university journey, particularly towards the end, has been very rewarding. Um, and not only that, I was very proud of myself for, you know, taking the initiative to study exchange and thank you faculty of engineering and IT for giving me that scholarship and you know being outside of your comfort zone that was a big you know challenge for me I got to study in France and then also I got to be a part of the developer program I felt like that was an achievement for me to be a part of something so amazing so thank you again Altus and John for empowering women and making this initiative for us so through the six weeks of developer and being selected, um, through the six weeks of the developer program, I got to learn a lot of skills and, you know, having a mentor by my side definitely helped me with my confidence. And um, yeah, so thank you. It's been a great journey so far. Paige, plenty more to come. What about you, Eva, your biggest accomplishment? Yeah, I'm a bit similar to Paige in the sense it's been the journey of yeah. finding out where the intersection of all my passions and interests and skills lie. So it's, you know, finding myself working in the gender equity program, which is definitely for my social justice interests, but also being able to stay engaged with my STEM skills. So that's the musical and audio processing research, but then sharing this passion with the next generation and teaching uh, like Hannah. And it's really fun to be back in the classroom face to face this semester a little bit, which is exciting. And I think the other opportunity is, you know, I've been able to share all of these combinations of skills with other women in engineering groups as well. So I spent a month uh, with Engineers Without Borders in Timor Leste earlier last year, just before COVID. And to be able to do all of these things, it's like my happy place. Fantastic. Veronica. Yeah, I think that's a hard question for me as well, possibly because, and maybe this is my biggest accomplishment, um, is I've been doing stuff in STEM for many, many, many years. Um, you know, I haven't actually done the math, but I presume it's, it's got to be somewhere like 30 years. Um, and as you can imagine, the industry has changed enormously over that time. Um, and you know, that's part of what I love about it is I'm forever learning new things and solving new problems for clients. So I've worked in so many industries, um, both in technical roles, lead roles, um, project managing. Um, I've put together training courses and trained hundreds of people, thousands of people potentially. Uh, I've presented at conferences. I've been published um, and, you know, absolutely loving my role at the moment as the lead for Data for Good and all of the opportunities that uh, that opens up for me. Um, so it's really hard to say, you know, what is the biggest accomplishment um, but you know, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of or when I get the most enjoyment is when I'm in a position where I can put together a really good team working on a problem that's going to make a difference. Um, and, you know, just always love being what, what we can achieve as a great team. I love the core messages that are coming out around confidence and, you know, it's not the destination, it's about the journey as well. I've got one more question before I'm going to throw it over to the audience for a bit of Q&A. And I'm going to open this up to Gemma first, um, considering that you are the founder of Work 180. So it can be said that men dominate the industry, but some are the biggest advocates for women in tech. So in your opinion, what else can men do to help support and empower women? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, I, I think the first thing is in meetings or, or just in the workplace environment in general, if you witness behaviour which um, is not inclusive, um, or worse, then being that person to, to stand up and speak out there and then in that moment, calling out the behaviour is, is extremely important. Um, the second thing that men can do, but it also does come down to employers and employers encouraging men to be able to do this, but um, taking parental leave, working flexibly, you know, picking up some of those home duties to empower women to be able to focus more on their careers. Because at the end of the day, some of some women just don't have a choice. You know, if um, the domestic load, you know, as we saw in COVID does fall on women's shoulders. So I think men can, 
can pick up a little bit at home. I know my husband certainly doesn't have much of a choice there. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, but, um, you know, things like, uh, I know we're working remotely a lot at the moment, but there was kind of leaders leaving loudly. You know, so I'm going to go to pick up the kids from school, that type of thing in the workplace. Fantastic. What about you, Eva? Yeah, totally agree on calling out behaviours that need to change and also being visible about it because um, the more male allies that we have that are visible, you know, that builds a community uh, in, the, in the workplace. The other thing is to understand the people around you, you know, talk to the women around you. What has been their journey? We've shared all our journeys today. What about those who you work with? And what's their experience been or is in the workplace right now? And then have a look at how your organization is doing. What does your leadership look like? What does your grad program look like? Hiring practices? And what can you do about it in the position that you have? So I think, yeah, this is everybody's issue and it's very much top down, bottom up. Yeah, definitely. Um, Hannah and Veronica, have you got anything that you can pop in and then I'm going to go to Paige last? Um, no, I have to admit, I, I agree very much with um, the points that Gemma and Eva have made. Um, absolutely, it's about being vocal. Um, I think it's about being informed as well so that you can present arguments. You're not just saying that um, cor corporations, you know, the studies have shown corporations that have a balanced, uh, a gender balance in leadership positions actually have a better bottom line. It's about, you know, passing that message on, not just at work, but, you know, when you're out at the pub, when you're talking to your mates on the golf course. Um, and absolutely, I 100% agree. It's about them also enabling women by, for instance, um, you know, taking on more of those childcare duties. Um, but also, you know, talk to your daughters uh, we, uh, with the expectation that, you know, STEM is a great field to go into, you know, encourage them. Fantastic. Um, I might just reiterate some of those points that were made because I'm sitting here being like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, I think that generally in no other situation would we look to the minority and say, fix the problem you're experiencing. You know, and it frustrates me um, being a woman in tech that people are often more interested about hearing about being a woman in tech than they are hearing about what I actually do. Um, and it's this like dual experience of being in a workplace where suddenly you're um, hyper visible. Everyone wants to hear what you have to say, wants to hear your story, where the the entire time before that was spent feeling completely invisible, different to everybody. And like, nobody cared at all about what I had to say. So it's this sort of whiplash about like, whoa, now you care. And I think, you know, to, to men, um, we might be the only women in tech that they know, which means I find myself repeating myself a lot and saying things over and over and over again. And I feel like if men take an interest in women's lives, in general, they will learn what they need to know about our experiences. It doesn't need to be like a big change to the way they uh, operate in the workplace or like you got to do this thing you've never done before. It's just like care and have friends and listen to people and then you won't need to um, put that pressure back on women to explain the problem to you just so then you can go and like try and fix it because um, we've been working really hard for a really long time um, yeah. and it's nice to feel like somebody cares. Definitely. I'm going to end it off with you Paige. So I know you've got some advice that you want to give to all of the girls that are studying um, tech at the moment. So over to you. Okay so I recently graduated at UTS with um, a double degree in IT and business and I honestly felt like IT was something that well I, I knew that IT was where I wanted to pursue my career but most importantly at the beginning of my uni journey I wish I had someone to give me some advice that I could you know know my community and you know and the support network at UTS so here are some of my advice for any girls that are currently in uni right now um, so first of all know your uni community and know your resources yes there are orientation programs when you first start and you might they might seem so overwhelming and you might not even attend them um, and I don't know now with the virtual situation 
So yes, when you go to classrooms, you will see a lot of males and back to what Hannah was saying, um, connect with the girls there, but even go further than that, be a part of the women in engineering and IT community. Every uni would have one, I'd assume, um, to give you that sense of belonging, give you that confidence boost. Um, they also have many events as well and many initiatives that I will touch on. Um, and, you know, make the most of the experience, be a part of a uni society. Um, and that's just for the social aspect and challenge yourself, even be a part of a startup community, be a co-founder, go to the startup events. Um, and there's a career hub as well. So there are so many events that you could attend, whether it's just for professional development or it's just, you know, for a boost of some knowledge or, you know, something new in IT or something in the med field, um, if you're a board or a keen bean. Um, and challenge yourself with exchange programs. Um, UTS has a build program and um, there were so many of the scholarships for exchange programs as well. And this was before the pandemic um, and being a part of the Lucy mentoring program as the mentee, um, you know, you are given um, all the, um, you actually will have goal setting sessions um, and then you will work on those goals with a mentor that has um, had experience in the IT field um, for six months. So that's gonna be very valuable for you. Um, and um, overall, I feel, oh yeah. And at the end, you um, should definitely give back as well. So be a part of the reach out programs where you can be a part of the community and race awareness and participation of females in STEM. So with the Faculty of IT, um, they actually go out to schools um, and, you know, give the girls and guys hands-on experience um, and insight on careers in STEM. So definitely give back, um, take all these initiatives, they're all for you. So yeah, make the most of your uni experience. Fantastic, that's some great advice. Thank you, Paige. I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience now. Uh, so the first one is, I would love to work in the IT field in software engineering, but studied pharmacy and went through a boot camp. Um, there are so many amazing women in this space, and I'd love to be a part of it. Um, how do I get in? How do I get into it? Do you have any advice for me? Who wants? Anna. Yep. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I just want to start by saying I also worked in pharmacy for like ten years, so this definitely speaks to me. Um, <laughs> What I want to say is that something that it took me a long time to realize, uh, you are not constantly competing against every single amazing person you've ever met for any role or job or opportunity that you are applying for. So there is room for everyone. And don't think that just because there are other people out there who you're seeing, who you're looking up to and going, I'm not as good as them, doesn't mean that there's no room, you know, um, and then the second thing I want to say is that your um, you will you will strengthen what you focus on. And uh, as I say to my students, your comparison is your kryptonite. Um, if you focus on yourself and your unique capabilities, which is inclusive of your background in pharmacy, um, that's what's going to be interesting. That's what's going to separate you from other people that have the same technical skills. If it's a blank piece of paper and you've got the same skills, but you've you've got this cool experience through a boot camp and pharmacy, then that's what's going to differentiate you. So don't be afraid to hero your own journey because what makes us different is what makes us interesting. Some great advice. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, I think networking events can be really um, useful. So we actually just hired. Um, uh, a lady from um, a boot camp. She did She Codes. I think it's a 12 month course. But prior to that, she was in a different industry. But she actually got referred to us um, from someone else in the industry from a networking event. So awesome. Um, so the next one there are so many fantastic female empowerment books out there in today's age. Do any of you have a recommendation for a book that has had a significant impact on your career?
I'm going to be very honest and say I'm still reading. So I'm kind of super keen to hear other recommendations as well. I've got a stack of 10 books next to my bed right now. So yeah, I, I started probably a while ago with Lean In from Cheryl Sandenberg and some things I took away from that, some things I, I found controversial, but yeah, keen to hear from others. Awesome. Does anybody else have any recommendations? I know that Brene Brown um, is a theme that definitely comes up in our team at work. I'm yet to read any of her books, but they're definitely on the list. I read right. a really good one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, you go. Um, I read a really good one by um, Jamila Rizvi, who is an Aussie um, media star um, called Not Just Lucky. And Though she does talk about her background in media and communications, it is definitely applicable to anybody who has um, struggled with confidence in whatever area they are pursuing. Um, because as the title suggests, it, it sort of goes against that moniker that we always say where it's like, oh, I'm so lucky that I blah, blah, blah. I'm so lucky that I got this job. So lucky that I got this award, this position. You're not lucky. You actually worked really hard. Like we just need to sort of combat that um, within ourselves. And she opens with um, a speech that she gave at her alma mater at university um, when she was now, you know, famous and well-known um, and talks about how, you know, sitting before me are all these people who are going to experience these hurdles, like we've spoken about in this panel. Um, and that, if I'd have known that I would have left and had all these things against me, I probably would have just given up. Um, but we really have to own our hard work and conscientiousness. And that, yeah, that book really um, invigorated me, especially when I was in a corporate environment, because there's a lot of pressure to just um, downplay your achievements. That's a really good segue into the next question, actually, um, because confidence has been a theme in the webinar today. So what advice do you guys have to share with females who are struggling uh, with confidence and having a voice? I can jump in on that one. And um, we may have touched on it a bit earlier, um, but you know, one of the things that I think is really important is the way that you express yourself. Um, so joining something like Toastmasters and just having that confidence um, in how you modulate your tone, how you use your body language, how you tell a story, um, making that part of speaking easy um, means that you're not worried about that then when you do have to speak up. Um, of course, this is based on the assumption that, you know, you, you, ideally you're gonna be confident in your work and your views anyway. So if you found a field that you're passionate at and that you're good at, you know, you should have that confidence anyway. And then it's just a matter of, well, how do you express that externally? Um, and I think that really makes a difference with how you're treated. If you speak with confidence and with authority, people will then start coming to you and that it becomes a, a, a self-feeding loop in that you will feel more confident as well. So, you know, ne never underestimate the importance of how you speak. Definitely. Any, anyone else got some advice on how to deal with confidence? Um, I want to just mention that some of my closest like peers and mentors are not self-promoting um, ambassadors for gender equality. Um, some, of the, some of the people I've come across, some of the women I've come across are just quietly chugging along, getting the job done and doing really well. So don't feel the, like you have to um, sort of explain yourself or if somebody comes to you with a woman in STEM question, just throw it back on them and say, well, what's it like being a man in STEM? You know, just, just, check out of that moment, make them see how ridiculous the question really is and say, actually, here's what I'm working on at the moment. If you want to hear about it, you can ask me about it. Um, because there's this dual thing of like, here's my expertise, my actual technical expertise. And then here's my expertise at being myself. And you don't always have to um, go into that sort of zone if you don't want to. So just contribute as your job would necessitate or as your expertise would necessitate. Um, you don't have to have a confident personal story um, and you don't have to share anything you don't want to share. It's a really good tip. Uh, the next question is, thank you everyone for sharing your experiences. So if you're having a down day, what are some of the things that you do to pick yourself back up? 
happy to jump in with this one. Mine's twofold. Um, I think it was Hannah that mentioned it before about having an awesome support crew, you know, because some things, you know, they look a bit, bit poor for the day, but it's always great to chat to your support crew for a reality check. And this comes into the confidence as well. Uh, so yeah, surround yourself with people who care about you and those who might work in STEM, but also those who don't. Uh, because it's always good to hear from how different people think about things and how they might do things differently. The other one is food. You know, I love food. I love eating. And it's always lovely to eat with people so you can combine the two together. So, yeah, a balance of both. Great tips. I can jump in too. Just, um, you know, one other thing that I've always done I find helpful is uh, just connecting with nature. So when things get down, that'll often be the point where I'll take a walk um, and I always find that gives me perspective on problems um, because nature is so big um, and usually the problems seem quite small in comparison. It just helps you readjust your focus. So sometimes just step out of a problem, find a bit of space, um, focus on something entirely different and, and look for beauty wherever you find it. And I really find that helps, um, you know, even the, even the keel for me and, and, and give me a much better perspective. Great tips. And um, I, I really love that point, uh, Veronica, because I certainly um, do that too when I'm having a down day getting outside and getting some fresh air. But there, there's a saying, and I think it's something like 99% of problems or pain is in your imagination. And I think quite often we find ourselves worrying about the what ifs or instead of, well, is this right now actually an issue that is impacting me? I've got a roof over my head. I've got food, I've got water, everything is okay. And kind of just taking a step back to, to look at a bigger bigger picture, which I think, you know, particularly during COVID, I was one of the unlucky people that was um, based in Melbourne, away from my family and certainly had, and also navigating a company through a, a global pandemic, some, some very challenging times. And so um, just taking it right back down to, to basics, um, I think can really help get you through a, a down day. Awesome. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's one for you, Eva. Um, WEIT does great work at UTS, but what is the one biggest thing you are still struggling to do? And what one change or one thing would you like additional support for? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think we've got a fabulous women in engineering IT community. You know, we've got Lucy mentoring, go out to schools. We run a lot of social events and things on campus. Um, I'd love to see this community grow because we do have conversations with students and staff who are like, why, what, what is your unit for? Uh, do we have a problem? Um, so how do we still have these conversations and bring people on board for action, but also from bottom up and top down as well? Um, so how do we get more students involved? How do we get leadership involved? How do we get men involved? And what's an interesting discussion at the moment is how our name uh, can be quite exclusive because people see the words women in engineering and IT and go, oh, I'm, I'm a man, I can't join. But that's definitely not the case. So how do we grow the community because it's actually everybody's issue? Yeah. And I'm just going to backpack off that Lucy mentoring there because there's another question here that I think will be good for you, Paige. Um, I'm joining the UTS Lucy mentoring program this semester. I'm really excited, but I've never done anything like this before. So do you have any specific tips as what I should ask my mentor and what experience and skills I could try and gain and learn from them? Um, you will have the goal setting session with the amazing Yemi. Um, she will help you understand and break it down to you. And she'll tell you that whenever a situation is bad, just change your response. Um, so, so many advice. So you will you'll kick off the program with goal setting. Um, but on top of that, your so you'll work on your goals. So your goals could either be confidence, um, finding a role in STEM after um, an internship and stuff like that. So not only do you work on your professional development, but you also actually get a taste of what it is like to be in a STEM role by shadowing them. Um, so don't be afraid to ask, um, ask as many questions as you can. Um, and um, the communication will be very frequent. Um, you know, you don't have to meet, it could just be via text. So yeah, well, you know, if you ever need that dose of motivation or something, so do not be afraid to reach out. They're only there to help you. They would love to help you and they're currently in IT. Um, so, you know, they just wanna empower you and inspire you. So do not be afraid to ask anything okay fantastic advice we're going to end it off we've got one more question 
I'm going to throw this over to you first, Hannah. Um, after a few years of the Women in STEM manicure, have you ever found that you become the token woman in your workplace? Uh, will your colleagues disregard what you have to say or talk down to you because you are a woman? Oh, man. <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, I will say when I was when I was working at um, Macquarie Bank, I was in a technology graduate program, which was fantastic because it meant I got to taste test um, different teams and see where I'd like to fit. Um, lots of people use it as an opportunity to explore different roles, you know, maybe UX design, product management, um, but I decided to stick with software engineering for every single one. Um, and in two of my teams, I was the only woman. And in two of my teams, there was one other. Um, and in both of those teams, the other one left while I was there. Um, and I have had varied experiences. When I say varied, I mean, ranging from um, genuine, like inappropriate workplace behavior that was handled by um, the company to very um, covert, um, you know, behavior that would undermine me, um, that would negate what I had to say, um, that took opportunities away from me, um, ranging from, you know, I, I, you know, there was a panel I was meant to be on to meet the CEO. And then my boss actually was the one who like said and did something to pull strings to have me removed from the panel. Um, I was, I received a scholarship to go to a conference that my work would not um, pay for because when I asked them if I could use my education budget, they were like, what are you actually going to do there? Um, which is like, you know, attend talks, learn things. It's a conference. It just happens to be for women in, in STEM. Um, and then I did have a boss as well who was, he, he, you know, he couldn't understand that I was doing all this stuff on top of my job. Um, and was trying to rate my performance um, low, even though I hadn't exceeded expectations for the targets we'd set because I was doing all these other things as well. Um, so, uh, what, sorry, other things as in women in, in tech initiatives, creating initiatives for the company, heading those initiatives, sourcing people to be engaged, all that kind of stuff. So having my work undermined, um, having my performance um, degraded, having my you know self be dismissed in the workplace it's it's part and parcel and it does sit um it doesn't sit well with me sometimes when people ask for advice about should i go into the tech industry um to say i know we've talked a lot about confidence but this is not a confidence problem this is like a systemic problem but no matter how confident i am that's not something that confidence can fix so i i am realistic um when i provide advice about certain career pathways, certain opportunities. I'll never recommend something that I haven't had personal experience with um, just because I think it can be a little bit um, irresponsible in a way, especially because there are environments that just aren't safe for women and may not be for a while. So if I'm being honest, yes, um, but it's nothing that I haven't been able to overcome in time. Um, nothing that my support group wasn't able to help me through um, and nothing that wasn't handled appropriately um, when escalated to those systems. So yes, it happens, um, but hopefully you'll have people around you that believe what you say, um, see what you're seeing and help you get out of those situations. Fantastic. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Happy to Hannah's points? Yep. Yeah, happy to jump in um, from my experiences about being a token woman. I think it started quite early in my career because I would be the token woman sitting on panels, uh, asked to speak for things, but also in interviews. And I think after I realized this was what was happening and it was a tick box exercise, I started to broaden out who else we could ask so that it didn't become a tokenistic effort. People actually then realized, oh, wait, this is actually better. So it actually started to change what practice looked like. So yeah, it's, it's getting better, um, but definitely there are positive, po positive ways for action as well, is to make it the norm. Great. I'm gonna end it off. I've got one more question that kind of ties into that last point um, that I'd love to hear your opinion on. So what advice would you give male leaders when it comes to supporting women who report directly into them? So 
I'll probably kick it off with you, Gemma. Um, I think um, listening, uh, listening to them and being aware of your team's interactions and ensuring there's inclusivity, watching out for microaggressions, making sure that, um, yeah, because to Hannah's point, it's not necessarily like a really kind of one outstanding big thing that can happen. It can actually be lots and lots of small little comments that might not seem like much, but they absolutely do have an impact. And so just keeping your ear to the ground and, and noticing those types of things is, is really, really important. Great advice. Paige? Um, I feel like it's already part of Altus values to, you know, be equal and, you know, on my first project and everything, I feel like the male within my project has been very supportive um, in a way. Now they're my role models as well. So um, I'm very happy with the way things are um, within Altus and my project at the moment. So yeah, I, I have, I don't have much to comment. Awesome. Um, anyone else? Um, I think you can be proactive. Like we all know that this is a fraught situation to be in. Um, and if you are a male boss with a female team member, um, anticipate. You know it's going to happen. You know that these things are going to come up. So if you can put in safeguards to ensure that the team knows um, in a way that's not singling anybody out, um, then you're going to future-proof yourself from problems that are 100% going to arise. So. I would say be proactive. I would also say um, hero that person, find opportunities for them to learn, um, for them to share um, their own experiences and for them to grow. So yeah, be proactive and, and actively help them grow. I'm, I'm saying these things with a particular um, male boss of a friend of mine in mind who, you know, I, I was like stellar job, you know, really well done. Awesome. I know we've run a bit over time. Um, Thank you all for joining us here today. You know, it's really opening up the conversation around confidence and, and women's journeys in IT and kind of breaking down those barriers. So I really appreciate all of your insights and advice. Um, remember to keep the conversation going at that hashtag women in science. But thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been good. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our audience as well for tuning in. Great. Have a great day, everyone.